bring the meeting to order. In accordance with open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, those listening at home. We'll start this evening off <coughs> with our uh, property tax classification hearing, our annual one, and turn it over to the town administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the board's electronic meeting packet this evening, uh, added late, uh, late this afternoon, is a PowerPoint presentation, which the chief assessor, Ms. Carboni, will be reviewing here this evening. Um, I believe, and I'm looking to the finance director on this to confirm that we've tried to consolidate the presentation into a, a, the, a, some of the more relevant slides up front, and then there's a series of slides that are, are backup information that we can review if necessary during the hearing um, here. Allow Mr. Schultz to read the public hearing, and then we probably I need to read I didn't mean it. to jump in front of you, Mr. Schultz. Yeah. Okay. No, that was my mistake. I, we I all forgot about it. Uh, we have a notice of public hearing, the North Reading Board of Selectmen Property Tax Classification Hearing. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 20, 2017 at 8 p.m. at North Reading Town Hall, 235 North Street, Room 14, to determine the percentage of the total local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property for fiscal year 2018 in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56. Interested taxpayers are encouraged to present oral testimony at this hearing or may submit information on their views in writing to the Board of Selectmen's office, either to the above address or via email at townadministrator at northreading.gov, no later than 12 noon on November 16th. And this was uh, uh, signed by Michael Prisco, Prisco, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, on November 9, 2017. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I might, as a matter of disclosure, uh, prior to uh, any discussion, uh, I have a family member who happens to own some uh, commercial industrial property in the town, and as a result, um, if the recommendation this evening is to remain on a, a single tax rate, I will be able to participate. Uh, any discussion relating to shifting of the tax rate, I will not be participating and will be recusing myself. But if the uh, recommendation and the motion before us will be for a single tax rate, I will be participating. Mr. Chair, I have a, a similar uh, disclosure. I do own commercial property in town as well. Um, I do not feel I have to recuse myself on that, but I just want to disclose that to the public. So make sure the record shows those. Okay. Thank you. Please continue. I'll turn the, uh, turn the presentation over to the Chief Assessor, Ms. Debbie Carboni. Good evening to everyone and welcome to the annual 2018 property tax classification hearing. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Debbie Carboni and as Mike Gilberto said, I am the Assessing Manager for the Town of North Reading. This tax classification hearing is part of the tax rate process. We must hold this hearing in order to certify our tax rate. I do just have a couple of notes that I do want to read before we begin the um, hearing uh, PowerPoint presentation, if you don't mind. Fiscal 18 was an interim adjustment valuation year for the town of North Reading. The interim year adjustments were certified by the Bureau of Local Assessment staff to ensure the values are derived utilizing a methodology base of accepted mass appraisal practices. What that means is the Department of Revenue mandates every city and town the methodology to certify our values. Our values by class, our residential values, our commercial values, our industrial, and our personal property. So those were, those were certified October 12th of 2017. Uh, the statistics must conform to the commissioner's minimum standards for certification. The purpose is for measuring the level of uniformity 
of assessments before and after the revaluation. The average single family is 537,467 for fiscal year 2018. These numbers will come up again in the presentation. For fiscal 2018, we had eight new residential homes. The commercial and industrial base is increased to a million eleven six hundred and fifty four thousand. We currently have we currently have three hundred I'm sorry, wait a minute. <laughs> I lost my place. For, uh, I need to go back to the single family. The uh, physical 2017 was nine new houses and physical 2016 was 14 new houses. What my office is seeing right now is we have a lot of houses that are valued in the two, 250, 275 thousand range that is actually being torn down in the new houses being built. So that's the reason why two years ago we had 14 new houses. Fast forward today, we only had eight. So I just wanted to explain that. We, we still receive the growth from the new houses, but we're just not seeing as many. We don't have as many subdivisions going in either. Okay, with that being said, we'll start the presentation. The selectman's role, selectman's role, selection of a minimum residential factor. The minimum residential factor is our total levy in the percentages that are allocated amongst the classes. The second thing that has to be voted on is the open space discount. The third thing is granting a residential exemption or granting of a small commercial exemption. North Reading's levy profile today is the residential assumes 87.76% of our value or of our levy. The commercial, industrial, and personal property is made up of the 12.24%. Residential and commercial, industrial, and personal property, otherwise known as CIP, for fiscal year 2017, we're taxed at the same rate of $16.13. The following four lines just show you where our levy has gone from fiscal 2015 to 2018. You can see that it's very healthy and it's growing. What is a split or dual tax rate? Communities decide to tax residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property differently. The statute allows an increase in the CIP's share of the tax levy up to 50% higher than the residential. That 50% is decided from the percentage of the minimum residential factor of the 87.76. It does not generate new revenue. It reallocates the levy burden due for the classes. The town of North Reading did split the tax rate in two years. 1988 and 1985. 
Commercial property valuation. The appraisal process involves the assembly, analysis, and classification of various types of information into a value estimate. The three approaches traditionally used to value property are the cost, the market, and the income. The assessors consider the amount of data collected, the strengths, the weaknesses, the relevancy of each valuation approach and determines an assessed value for each property. I want to stop here and just kind of ask, does anyone have any questions? No? In Massachusetts, property must be assessed at full and fair cash value. That is for all classes. The terms full and fair cash value or market value are essentially synonymous. The town of North Reading currently issues our tax bills to the commercial industrial properties on our cost data not the income and expense, with the exception of one property, and that borders Wilmington that's on River Park. So it, it, I can't apply an income so, or a cost. The Department of Revenue certification process is very straightforward in the methodology used. The town must prove the three approaches to value the cost, the income, and the market, with sufficient data to support the final value. The income and expense statistics. North Reading mailed out 287 income and expense reports. We mail the income and expense out every single year. Since 2011, that was the first year that we mailed them out annually. Prior to that, they were mailed out every three years. 180 of the income and expense reports were returned. <coughs> Excuse me. We assess a penalty of $250 on 107 prop properties for the total of $26,750. That 107 were not returned, so we do apply the penalty. That is the maximum penalty that the Department of Revenue allows. Why do you think, what do you think their motivation is for not setting it? You know, Mike, I, I hear a lot of different reasons, some of them never seen it, some of them never received it, some of them just don't want to share their information. That's reality. At the end of the day, the next slide will explain when we receive when we receive these income and expense forms that we mail to every business in the town. What we're looking for, we're looking for you to give us what your rents are. We're looking for you to tell us how much snow plowing did it cost you last year? How much did you get charged in waste removal? How much did you get charged in um, the septic pump out? Your expenses also become part of our analysis. So we're looking for two major keys in this data. We're looking for your rental amounts and we're looking for your expenses because those two items determine one of the methodologies that I have to, one, report to the Department of Revenue, but also clear and concise valuation of that income commercial property. So rent on Park Street is not going to yield the same rent as you would find on Main Street. 
they, it's just location. Location is a factor. With that being said, you know, I encourage them to return them. That's all I can do. At the end of the day, we do <clears throat> receive in 64% of the INEs that were mailed out. That is good data for us to use, that percentage. By no means do am I saying don't worry about it, we have enough. That isn't what I'm saying. If I could get a 287 return, that would be wonderful. So well, let's increase the number then. Yeah. The 250 chart, I can't, I'm state mandated. That is the maximum charge. When we began this penalty, we did not start at $50 or $100. We went right to $250. Well, we didn't have anything at all before. I'm sorry, what was that? We had anything in the previous year. No, we didn't. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, question, Ms. Carbone, because I, I phone these out for my business, and I, are these forms from the state or are they our own town form? Uh, these are generic forms that all appraisal companies use. Because I, I think for the small business owner that's maybe a one or two man show, I, these forms are pretty complicated and you have, I have to literally go through QuickBooks and bucket every single expense and every single like, what do I spend on insurance, what do I spend on storm, you know, everything. And I, I think it's pretty, is there any way we can simplify this form for the small business owner to make it easier? Because it's, it it's a two hour process for me to do this. And I'm assuming somebody who's maybe not, you gotta look all this stuff up. Some of these guys are probably, men and women owned businesses are spending more money than the 250 by having their accountant do this. And I think that might be part of the reason of the non-compliance. If we can simplify the form, I think you might get more in. The way the form is laid out, uh, the answer to your question, could anything can be simplified, anything can be changed and or altered. I do know, like in Middleton, we have separate ones we, because we have hotels there. So we send the hotels their specific one. There's a lot more data that we're looking for from the hotel. Uh, can we make them a little clearer and concise? Maybe I could alter the form I think you more or compliance. produce my own, I, okay. sure. Because they are, I mean, I'm looking at some of the business owners out here and I'm sure would agree with me. It's a pretty onerous form to fill out, especially some of the people that have much more. I see Mr. Lee, you, you're shaking your head. I, I can picture someone that does the volume you're doing. It's, you probably, I don't know how much you spend on your account to fill out that form, but if we could simplify it, I think you'd get more of a response. Okay, I can, I can definitely work on that. I, I think, the best suggestion I would come up with for feedback from the commercial industrial owners sitting here today would be do you want it specifically towards your business? Mr. Lee, you own a restaurant. So would you like that form that is specific for restaurants? Mark Hall, you have you have rental for commercial. Would you like to see them separate just for that and not include the other data on that form? I can dissect the form is what I'm saying and send it specific to the use. Does that make sense? Okay. We can we can do that for the January mailing. We can do that. I mean, you could, you could host a workshop. I wouldn't, I wouldn't right. be you opposed. You could host a workshop maybe through the chambers <clears throat> and come in here and put the form up on there and get their feedback. And maybe you modify it. Maybe you have two or three versions based on different types of companies. But sure. maybe having a workshop and getting the feedback direct from the business community before you just rush off and do something because you could create more work or make it even more cumbersome. You see this start to drop. Um, that would be my suggestion. I think it's a great one by Mr. Schultz. I love the idea of workshops. I think getting the uh, business community to come in. And if no one shows up, then so be it. But hopefully they will. 
I think uh, the chamber's here this evening, and I'm sure they would help you uh, get the word out. And I would encourage sure. you to do that. Okay. Sure, we can okay. do that. We Please can continue. plan on hosting one. Uh, we were on the next one, too. The first process in determining your rent schedule data is by collecting the INEs, the 38 Ds. The data is then analyzed by the different commercial and industrial classes or use of the property. The INE data must have a rent range in the rent schedules. The reason for this is due to location, building, and use. This refers back to the comment from conversation that Main Street rent versus Park Street rent would yield something totally different. And then you dissect that even a little bit further to the use. If the community does not have enough data in the returns, the assessor will then check the local market in the abutting communities. These, there are also program resources that I use. I use them regardless. The, one of them is LoopNet, the other one is CoStar, and then you always have the MLS. These resources are also a great tool to verify the income and expense data returned is within the market range that you're anticipating. The rent schedules are finalized, applied to the properties of like kind. The properties that did not return their INEs are subject to the 250. When I say the rent schedules are finalized and applied to properties of like kind, what I am saying is even if a commercial property did not return their income and expense, that rent, vacancy, and expense rates are still applied to that property. That has been globally on Main Street. Your rent for retail is $15 a square foot. I'm going to apply that same rent schedule as the other property they did return it. This is just a graph to show you where we've where we started and where we are today. We're the the returns are pretty much plateaued. This is not unusual. It's not uncommon. We are right we hover around 63-64% return, which in reality is not that bad even if you ask other communities that do send them out annually not every community sends them out annually north reading property classes excuse me the town has 4266 single families we have 755 residential condominiums. We have 72 multifamilies. This multifamily, I do want to just kind of, this is your two families, your three families, your four families. The mixed use properties, these are apartments with, you know, stores down below or an office or whatever. We have 221 residential vacant land, giving us a total of residential parcels to be 5,336. That number will come back. The open space discount, this is one of the votes that is in front of you tonight. The open space discount doesn't apply to the town of North Reading. We do not have any open space. A lot of people 
I get confused between classified open space and farmland or chapter land. Yes, we do have chapter land, but that falls under a different classification that actually falls under our commercial and industrial um, numbers. So we do not have any classified open space. Deb, can we do me a favor quickly? Sure. Can you go back to the property class? Sure. So I didn't ask for it this year, but I, I would like to see this in the future if it's possible and if it's relevant. So you got 4,266 4, single family homes. But my understanding of the way the assessed value works is that, you know, I, you may have somebody that lives in a um, $350,000 home to four, those that live in 350 to 450. Uh, those may have sold a lot more around town than let's say somebody that's in the 900 to a 1.5 million dollar home, right? You're absolutely correct. So the values, their assessed value would be more than those, they would have an increased percentage more than those that were in the higher valued homes under that scenario, correct? You are correct. That is not uncommon. Again, everything is market driven. Right, market driven. So the market driven Back about five slides ago when I was explaining the, the number of new houses, what I'm seeing is exactly that range that you were just talking about, the lower end homes up to say five, 530. Those homes are being torn down and the 6,000, 5,000, 6,000 square foot houses are being built. Right. This is not uncommon in this kind of market. So under that scenario, you may have a lot of seniors that live in that $400,000 home today in this town. Even though those homes are not really popular, that means the percentage of increase is more in that range of homes than it is, like I said, on the more expensive homes, right? So they're really taking more of a burden, I think percentage-wise, than somebody that lives in a more expensive home under the other scenario. To to explain that a little bit further and go back to market driven. Yep. So I just say hypothetically, I have this older subdivision and I have it valued at $450,000. Mm -hmm. And yes, that is made up of people that have lived there for 30 years. Fast forward, they sell that house for seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars they're driving my market they that sale just drove my market from that four hundred and fifty thousand dollar value up to the seven hundred yeah. and that again it it is all market driven I execute what the market tells me is the demand but it does impact the seniors that want to stay in town when you look at the market. It's just unfortunate the way this works. Correct. So I'm not so sure if there's a way to show us that range of where you're seeing the largest amount of sales so we can see it and understand it. Because I think when you go to the next few slides, <clears throat> I'll bring up why. So you can go ahead and continue. The residential exemption is the other vote before you tonight. The Board of Selectmen may adopt an exemption up to 20% to shift the residential class burden from lower assessed properties that are not the principal residence of a taxpayer to the higher assessed properties and to properties that are not the principal residence of the taxpayer. This exemption has really been adopted in your cities, Chelsea, Brookline, Boston. Those cities have a lot of rental. They're not their primary residence. Um, it, it is to relieve the tax burden of the lower priced homes in Brookline, but the ones that are not their principal residence would not receive that exemption. So that's 
just to explain how that residential exemption there's key elements in that that we do want to hear and that is the the lower priced homes that rate and value get shift over to the higher assessed the higher valued properties but they can't be their principal residence didn't they do that in Reading? Mm. No, I know what you're talking. That that's something different. That is something different. That is a yes. That was a different, and it's actually somewhat of a study. It's a home run rule, what they call, and that will expire two years from this uh, December. Now, what happens when that expires? That may or may not go back in front of legislation to become statute but right now it's in like a trial period to see if this will work it is called the residential exemption but not the classification hearing residential exemption they really should have named it something different yeah. to be well, honest thank you for explaining that right okay. so uh this is uh, the next two the next three slides are scenarios if the board chooses the residential exemption and you can see just in and i just took some of our lower end homes our median assessed value and then a higher priced home and you can clearly see that the shift is reduced from the lower end home the median stays the same and the higher assessed home would receive that savings that the lower assessed home gets and again we we want to remember we're not increasing our taxes here no this does not increase it shifts the burden that's what it does but if we wanted to help our seniors stay in this community we could consider something like this I know you try to say this is more for a city but you could use it for that this type of a tool to help our seniors am I wrong because they it's to me it tends I tend to believe that our senior community lives and if you look at that three three hundred and thirty four three hundred and forty three thousand dollar home mm -hmm. that's roughly where our seniors are living the majority not all but the majority um, and if we want to do something to help that senior stay in this town, which does have a positive effect on our school system, because now we're not selling that home and filling it with school-aged children, um, would that be a, an irrational scenario that we use this type of a tool? <clears throat> Rational? Could it apply? Absolutely. That's why it's here in front of the Board of Selectmen tonight for a vote. Is it the most predominant? I guess what I would, in <coughs> it's your vote. I just provide you the data. What you want to look at is the fact that your higher end homes are paying, are gonna absorb that increase. So just be cognizant of that. That's all. I, I'm just is throwing it, a, it out there is it for a way? any board member input because what I hear around town from the seniors is they want to stay here, but we're getting to a point where the taxes are at a level where they have almost forced to sell their home and go into some kind of a assistant living or some type of a scenario that they don't like. And I just put it out there for for yeah. other for conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We have a little bit of time, and you know. Mr. I, Mr. O'Leary. I just have a quick question. That, you know, what, what would be helpful is, you know, how many properties would be impacted? You know, do we have any data as to how many would actually fall into this category that we could shift it to and from? And that might help a little bit quantify. Yeah. I, I'd like to do something I do. to help our seniors. Uh, and this is a scenario that I wanted to just have the conversation about. And I'm not saying it has to be 10% either. Right, it could be less than ten percent if we wanted it to be. Uh, exactly, it's up to twenty. Twenty, yeah. So yes, up Mr. To twenty. 
Um, Ms. Carvone, I, I know when I'm familiar when I was with the Chamber of Commerce, Reading did it, they did more of a senior tax relief targeted towards exactly. seniors. And what they did is they created three classes of taxpayers. They had <coughs> senior residents, non-senior residents, and commercial. And they did a very slight split, up, split on the commercial. It was like 1.01 or 1.02. So the commercial, would, the commercial and the non-senior residents would pay for the residential senior tax relief. Is there a way we could do that as far as have the commercial properties and the non-resident seniors help subsidize the seniors? That was the one that's under the home run rule, right? Yeah. The way I understand that, and I'll, I'll make sure that I'm thinking correctly and get back to you, but we have to wait until, like we can't just jump on board with them. We have to wait until that has been clarified that it works. That's, the home run rules work differently than when it's just initiated into statute. What do you think the time now, frame would be on that? I'm not, I'm sorry, what was that? What do you think that? the time frame would be to find out if we could do something like that? I'll be honest with you, I really wouldn't want to give you a time because I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I would hate to mislead and say, oh, well, maybe we could get it done for next year. I would, I would definitely want to make sure that I know it could be implemented with a, a time frame I can give you a date. But I do have some numbers. Do you want to hear them? If you don't mind, and then yeah. I'm going to allow Mrs. Min, you probably ask oh, a sure. question after. Why don't you please go ahead. Uh, you but go? this 10% this exemption, it's not really going to be targeted to seniors. It's going to be targeted to any. That's correct. Who's yeah. That's correct. Value. And then that, that exemption, if we were to approve that exemption, we're just shifting responsibility of payment to just everyone because we don't that's, unless we split the rate right do we correct. also have the senior exemption in place anyway for qualifying seniors that or is that is that something different that that we're going to be considering so in other this words eligible seniors um can seek a, a senior exemption do we have that kind of a program already we would we do have senior exemptions we have this senior work off program we have um we have all of the statutory required exemptions uh we've increased them over time i do know one of the uh conversations is the senior work off right now that's in in discussion this exemption here, as far as it's not geared towards just somebody that is 70 years old. And it's, it's value. This exemption is based on value. So just say your condos at Greenbrier, those are valued around 200000 now I would have to verify occupancy to make sure that they do reside there, which that data is available. But we don't. But have to they do it for would that. also qualify. We could just do this for single-family homes, because you haven't broken out that way. You showed the slide earlier. That's why I brought the slide up earlier. You have those types of apartments broken out separately. They would not. I wouldn't consider them qualified for this type of a, a residential exemption. It's. But this does fall under residential exemption. Okay, that's fine. What's your numbers you have? I broke out, I broke those numbers out for our single families and condos and stuff, Mike. It's, we've just always done that so mm -hmm. that you can see the single families increasing in our condos, where we're going with those and so on and so forth. So currently, we have 46 properties that are 250,000 or less. 250,000 or one, because I have to run it that way, to 500,000. 
we have 2,259 properties. 501,000 to the highest property, there's 1,961. Okay. Okay, okay. Ms. Carbone, yeah. on the left column there, should that bottom line be like 5,000 and change instead of 5,500? We're confused on, wouldn't the savings be the 560 off of that tax bill? The five, 5,608 is the net of the assessed value times the right. tax and rate, less that 560. Is that number So wrong? wouldn't the bottom line taxes paid be the 5608 minus the 560? That's this, what I'm struggling with. This 5,000 is the savings. This 18,000 is the increase. So you add this to that, you deduct it from the lower right. end. Right, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, Andrew. So basically what the, the data that you just provided us is 305 homes in town would qualify for this exemption if we executed this, based on what you just explained to us, right? That's the 46 that are in the 250 to, or less, and then the 259 that are in the 250, 250 one range to 500. So that's a total of 259 and 46 is 305. Right around there, yeah. So the 305 people, our residents, Andrew, would see a, a reduction of $560 in their taxes. Right. No. So where am I, this tax is it's 10% of the bill. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. What, I just, I'm not sure why the bottom line is 55, 55, 70. I, my apologies if Oh, that's just all okay. I, I, exactly. Okay. This uh, my apologies if it's I, and I will <coughs> calculate it to see. I thought I double checked it. Actually, I know I did. We can move on. So, I just wanted to put it out there for the, the board to consider because I want to see the seniors stay in town. I want to see the folks live in the homes that they want to live in and find a way to do that. And if it's a few hundred dollars, it may not sound like a lot, but five hundred dollars in their mind is significant. Mr. Larry. Yeah, just if you're going to refer to the Reading program, the Reading program was tied to the circuit breaker. That's uh, right. Tax credit, which the Commonwealth of Massachusetts oversees, and uh, is tied to income and assessed valuations of property. So it's, it's in, well, age, first of all, age, uh, income, and assessed valuation of property. So that they can quantify, you know, how many people qualified for the circuit breaker bill through the Department of Revenue, Mass Department of Revenue, so they know what the what the number is. Uh, but not all of those residents are property owners because some people qualify for the circuit breaker for rental, so it would actually be less than the total number qualified. So it has everything to do with age and income and assessed valuation of property. It doesn't really necessarily correlate to the same thing that this is being. That's, that's proposed right. to us. Totally different okay. uh, program. But it's geared specifically towards, and that, that program is targeted specifically towards uh, low income seniors who live in their home. Uh, and again, there's a cap on the assessed valuation, probably 650000 or something <coughs> like that, uh, in order to qualify. And again, it's easy to, to see who qualified because they don't have to come in with, here's my circuit breaker, this is what I got right. approved through the state. And then the assessed valuation income's already verified, and they have to apply every year. And again, That's the way correct. that they did it, they did it on a sliding scale, where if the average circuit breaker, I mean, the maximum circuit breaker for last year was just over $1,000, $1,070. Um, what they did in Reading is they scaled it 50% to 200%, so someone could get you know, anywhere from $500 to $2,000 tax credit, depending upon how the program was implemented. But it's a different concept than this and it was done through a home rule petition through the legislature and there were a couple of other communities that did it Sudbury and Wayland I think it was so uh, a little bit of a hybrid sure. thank you though for going through that I appreciate it no so problem. last point I want to make is those 305 homes that you talk about in those, those two ranges they did get an increase percentage wise more than the ones that the other 1,000 69 that were in the $500,000 range and above, right? Well, I can tell you our properties 
in the range up to about 450,000. Yes, those were the high, our overall increase percent is just below 3%. Our higher end homes are very stagnant. Our middle of the range, yes, those were valued at say 575,000, they're selling them for seven. Again, it's market driven. I execute what the market is telling me the demand is. So if that, if that value range home is being sold for $150,000, $200,000 over my assessed valuation, for me to certify my values, I do have to bring them up to what the market is indicating. Yep, I understand. So that's that's the scenario. I can tell you the higher the higher end homes are stagnant. And it's not just here in North Reading, it's somewhat most of the quadrant. We're so, it, they're plateaued right now. But yep. that market can change next year. Could but I think it's just important for everyone to know that. Yep. Yes, they are taking a big burden on this and I understand that those are very popular homes there are a lot of people are seeking it there's not enough inventory out there for those yes yeah. Mr. Larry and there's no doubt Mr. Chairman that over the last you know five to seven years um, the homes that were at an average assessed valuation have increased significantly and picked up a larger portion of the mm -hmm. tax levy burden let's put it that way uh, so that I mean like I live in what we considered an average assessed value at home and I think in my in the last seven years my taxes have increased 60 percent whereas someone who lives in a higher price home you know Trent. may have only seen a you know a 15 percent increase in their tax bills again but the higher price home is paying 16 seventeen thousand dollars a year I'm now paying eight thousand dollars a year whereas you know six seven years ago I was paying probably forty five hundred you know so you know so the average home in the town of North Reading and homeowners have taken a huge hit in relation to assessed valuations and the tax levy amounts that we can collect. So the burden has actually shifted down to the lower price homes. And which is where our seniors live. That's which is where the our only seniors reason are why so, I brought this up. But I mean, it. it's market driven and it's unfortunate, you know, you have to sell in order to capitalize on and it. If we can think about it next year, if there's a solution like the one you talked about in that circuit breaker maybe for us, yes, Mr. Masseri? I had suggested we take a look at this last year for this year but after hearing what Reading has done and, and Steve clarifying it, mm -hmm. I think that has more benefit to the seniors yeah. and I think it was the scene at least when I was suggesting we look at it I was thinking of the seniors not necessarily the lower income sure uh, the lower value the first time houses. buyers you know, yeah. more for yeah. the seniors yeah so are you volunteering, Mr. No, Siri, to work so on this for the next year? <laughs> <laughs> no, but we can, we, think we can get that quantified rather I would quickly like through to. the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. We can inquire, yeah, I would. The, the administration not, can I'm inquire as to, you know, how many people qualified for the circuit breaker bill. Yeah. Again, there are a number of people in our community um, that still aren't aware that they would qualify for the circuit breaker bill. And if you offer a program like that, they may come in and get their taxes done as opposed to, they may, not be, they may be in a no tax status yet still qualify for a circuit breaker? Circuit I mean, we, I mean, I happen to do taxes, so that I see every year the number of people that are coming in and getting the circuit breaker, just qualifying for a circuit breaker on a state income tax. They have no federal tax liability. Uh, they have no state tax liability, but they qualify for the circuit breaker. And the senior center does a very good job. Representative Jones does a very good job of getting the word out around tax time, uh, making people aware, our seniors aware, that, you know, take a look at it, come in and, you know, uh, go to the senior center, go to the Shine program, or come to someone like me, and we'll find out if you qualify. And again, it could be up to a thousand and fifty, a thousand and seventy dollars that they would qualify for as a state income tax credit, money right back to you, just because income qualification-wise and the uh, tax burden is a certain percentage of the income. So, uh, if we institute a program like that, more and more people may become more aware and more inclined to take a look at it. I know we try to educate them when they come into our office too. I mean, we go through every single one of the exemptions that could possibly, they could qualify for. And we do tell them about those circuit breaker. Yeah. A lot of times we print it out and give it to them. So, uh, Mr. Um, Town Administrator, and, uh, 
finance director, if we could just put that on our to-do list maybe for next year. And, and Let's find out how many people I'm sure a few board, board members will be more than happy to volunteer the time to assist and try to just have something for a discussion for next year. Uh, I think we're all in favor of that. Mrs. Carboni, I, I know I took up a lot of your time in the presentation, so I think you can go past scenarios two and three. Okay. Um, since They're I think the same we're, thing. Yeah. The commercial oh, exemption is excuse very... Excuse me. One, I'm sorry. Oh. Mr. Masseri, I, did I miss you? Did you want to say something else? I was going to say, if, if the board is interested in uh, pursuing or uh, taking a hard look at this, I'd be happy to take the lead. That would be great. Thank now, you. If, if they're not, then it's a waste of time. I, That's I got the consensus that I think we are. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, I, I believe you're... I think we all want to help seniors with tax relief. Well, at least we can research an idea. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the low-income seniors that we're looking to target. So this is uh, the program that Reading instituted is exactly that. So. And so, when you look at the scenario that I just talked about, where you see the impact is right, and that tax levy, we I think we owe it to them at least to consider an option because I don't see it trending differently for a long time. No, I don't either. So. Okay, thank you. Please. So the commercial exemption works very similar to your residential exemption in the methodology. The Department of Unemployment sends every assessor's office a list of businesses that employ under, under 10 employees. The value of their business also has to be less than a, a million dollars. Now, if you take a strip mall, and I'll just do this quickly, if you take a strip mall that has five businesses, all five of those businesses have to qualify in order for this exemption to be accepted by the board. I can tell you we do not have any. We go through, our office goes through the report every year. So we know, in fact, we have 56 businesses that employ under 10 employees, but they do not qualify due to value. So we do, uh, the commercial exemption is one of the votes in front of you, but we do not have, to our knowledge, any properties that qualify for this exemption. Classification. The Board of Selectmen may shift the town's tax burden from the residential class to the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes as long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor. North Reading's minimum residential factor is the 87.7. This number was in the beginning of the slide, and that makes up our residential value percentage. This means that no more than 12.24%, which makes up commercial, industrial, personal property, can be uh, of the residential class burden can be shifted. The following page contains information on the impact of any shift of the tax burden. The Board of Assessors, and we only put this in here because in the past we have been asked for what our recommendation is. Our recommendation at this time is to maintain a factor of one or a single tax rate, but that it is the Board of Selectmen's vote this pie chart just shows you simply the percentages that we have been talking about all night. Um, the shifting of the rate scenario. This works, this worksheet, if you will, will show you that if I did it in increments of 10%, 25%, 50%, you can clearly see that the rate shift for the commercial and industrial, which is lines three, four, and five, will increase for 10%, it increases the tax rate to $17.97. For lines 
for 25%, it will increase it to $20.43. And 50% would be $24.51. The anticipated unclassified rate, because it is not certified by the Department of Revenue as of today, is $16.34. In conclusion, the options before us, we must set a tax rate and mail the tax bills before December 31st. The options before the Board of Selectmen is to vote on a tax rate to shift or not to shift, the residential exemption, the commercial exemption, and the open space discount. Does anyone have any questions? It's a public hearing, so if anyone in the crowd would like to ask a question, just go to the podium and... Mr. Mr. Chairman, more for the record, we did receive a letter from the uh, Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce, which was placed in the Dropbox folder for this evening's meeting. Thank you. I believe that was the only comment that we received. <coughs> any com Any questions? Board members? not I'm gonna close the public hearing and we can deliberate and make a decision okay, okay I'm gonna close the public hearing and uh, turn it over to the board members and I obviously go ahead Say thank you that was quite clear and very detailed so thank you thank you Deb I was a lot of work and Liz as well I know you put a lot of time into it and thank you uh, it certainly made it get through the process a lot easier um, you know I've done this now since my eighth presentation with you um, and they've gotten better every year and I appreciate oh, that um, but the scenario is 87 a little over 80 percent 87 percent is residential until we see that number get down to around 80 percent I just don't think there's a real valid rationale that we could ever come up with to ever discuss a shift um, you know when I first got on the board I, I was really just trying to get people to wake up that we couldn't even get these forms submitted and I am happy to see that they're at least over that 60 percent or over I 64. would like to see more but I think it's a wonderful idea that uh, Mr. Schultz has present, presented that you have a willingness to have a workshop and work with the business community to improve on that and that will help because when you look at and that, if you just go back to that discussion real quick, then we talked about that, those folks that live in that, those homes and those ranges, that's lower value of home, they're taking a big levy burden. You know, they're the ones that are, have the least amount of jobs or the jobs that are paying for them to do. A lot of fixed income, Michael. Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's we should do what we can and the business community should do what you can to help us get the right numbers on the, that 12, a little over 12%. We should have the right numbers to make sure that everyone is paying their fair share of the taxes and because we're all in this together. But at some point, our economic development will flourish, mm -hmm. and someday, hopefully, we'll get to close to 20% or over 20% in our commercial base, and then we may be having a different discussion. But until then, I just don't see there's a need, and I'm not sure if there's any other board member that feels different. And if not, I'll take a, a motion, and we'll move on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to establish a cl tax classification factor of 1.0 as recommended by the Board of Assessors. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And no, one abstention. I, I vote. Oh, you, you voted. Everybody. Good. Yep. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes. You still yes. have, oh, we have three one more, more votes. One more. Yes, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you notice votes. I didn't leave the <laughs> podium. Yes, two more votes. M Mr. Three Chairman, more votes? Uh, at this time, I move not to establish a residential exemption. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move not to establish a commercial exemption. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Unanimous. 
Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend the fiscal year 2018 property tax levy at $49 million. Uh, $6,144.19, which is $925.81 less than the levy limit. May I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Just to let everybody know, we don't tax to the max. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that's noted in the minutes. <laughs> everybody can be sleep well tonight, <laughs> knowing that your hey, board does not tax to the max. What's the, not a, a, one more motion? Adding, uh, He's right. Open, open space. Open space. space. I'm I found them finally. Yep. <laughs> I, I forgot we had uh, we got a shifted in the uh, yeah, meeting. We have a few more actually, but let's finish voting on this. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend to the Board of Assessors that the fiscal year 2018 tax rate be set at sixteen dollars and thirty-four cents per one thousand evaluation. I have a motion to have a second. Second, second by Mrs. Minupelli. Discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Should be the last one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move uh, to not establish a commercial exemption. We already did that one. Open yeah. space. Yeah, we already open did that space. one. The open, open space. space. Okay. I move, not, uh, I move to not establish an open space exemption. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Now we're good. And Mike, you will have to log in to sign the OA5 tomorrow. Tomorrow? You got it. <coughs> we have uh, oh, okay. <coughs> Put that in my okay. We have about nine minutes before the next hearing. Uh, so I'd like to open up the, can we go to the public comment? Anyone here for public comment? I, I need you to go to the microphone. Actually, you could actually take that microphone right there and just sit so down. Sit under the, the table there, right? Just state your name and address, please. Uh, my name is uh, Art Grossman, 29 Freedom Drive. And um, I'm here because uh, uh, I, st I started a coffee house in North Reading, not, not, a, not a place where you eat, but a place for, for music, and I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second. And uh, Bob is a tent, Bob Mysterio is t with his wife has attended it uh, a few times, and our last one was this past Saturday, and he uh, said he might say something about the coffee house at this meeting. And so I just wanted to make sure that if he did, if there were any questions, any comments, I was here to talk about it. Um, <coughs> You know, I've got a lot of time on my hands now, and I like doing projects. And uh, a little less than two years ago, I, I, I approached the friends of the library with the idea of doing a coffee house two, with two goals. One was to provide uh, an environment for performers in the in North Reading and surrounding communities, a place where they could perform in front of an appreciative and judgment-free audience. Uh, and uh, the second goal uh, was to raise money for the library through the friends of the library. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in the beginning, I, I probably played a lot more than I wanted to because we didn't have enough performers or enough, you know, well, enough performers. But over the last, you know, year and three quarters, it's really grown. I mean, uh, we had a tremendous night last time, uh, last Saturday. We had, I don't know, 50, 60 people there. We had about 14 performers. Uh, according to Adrian Callahan of the Friends, we raised more money than we ever raised, you know, any one of these things, except for when we had one concert. And we'll have concerts periodically. But uh, I just want to, you know, tell, the, tell people about it and uh, encourage them to come by and see what it's all about. It's, it, there's no admission. Uh, the money's raised through the sale of refreshments and donations. Uh, I think the only thing I'm going to stop doing is comedy because it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> but you know, if you if you sing, if you want to do poetry, if you you know anything, you can do it there. And uh, it, 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 you know, well, you you were there. I mean, it's 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 really come a long way, and I think it's I think we're we're clicking on all cylinders, and we're really achieving. All our goals. How often is it a regular schedule? Hour? It's uh, it's once a month. It's around the third Saturday of the month. 
This next one, December 16th, is, is the only one of the year where it's a little different, uh, where we're going to do, you know, usually we have, we have a sort of a stage set up with a, you know, PA system and, you know, we, nice lights and everything and people perform. For this one, we, it, it, this is the holiday version and we, uh, we, we encourage families to come. It's earlier in the day, it's 3 to 5 instead of 7 to 9 or 10. And um, you know, we sit around in a circle, we sing songs of the season, and we encourage you know, kids and families to be there. But other than this one, it's, uh, it's, it's more like if you went to a, a concert. In fact, somebody said last time it was like being at a concert. It was three hours. It, it, just, it just kept going. It was just great. So, Michael, if I may yes, uh, please, add, Mr. add to that, having attended a couple of times and I really appreciate the, the arts effort, the, uh, the Friends of the Library's effort, and uh, all of the volunteer uh, entertainers that come forward. Uh, what I didn't mention was that uh, there is a uh, organization called the Boston Area Coffee House of which his group is now a member. Yes. And there's some 35 member communities. So there's a lot of this going on around us. And uh, it's kind of nice that uh, once a month people could go to the library down the basement area and uh, listen to different musicians each of yeah. the sponsored nights. And uh, they just did a, a very, very nice entertainment evening doesn't cost very much. I would recommend that everybody make a donation because it will help the Friends of the Library and uh, their programs, uh, their money is spent for library events. So all in all, I uh, thank you for your efforts all right. and it's, all it's of not, those not, that it's not even uh, support right. uh, this organization. Thank you. My daughter has a band, and they're always looking for a place to sing, so I will make sure I mention I'm going to put you on a mailing list. And, put and, me on that and, mail. And, and you'll Absolutely. know when we, when we have it. I won't put you out as a performer. I'll put you down. No, you don't want me performing. Right. You're going to lose some customers. <laughs> yeah, he performs here often <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, can't give up my day job. Okay. Thank you. What do we have left? Let's see. Oh, no, we're good. We're at that time. So, next thing on the agenda is uh, we have a... Let's see, an extension of a seasonal license request. And I have a public notice that I am going to read in 30 seconds. And this is for the Thompson Club doing business as TCC Grill. And they're requesting an extension of their seasonal license from the end of November to the end of December. So with that now being 9.15, I'll read the public notice. The Board of Selectmen will hold a hearing on the application of Thompson Country Club, Inc., doing business as TCC Grill to Mid Iron Drive to extend their seasonal license from November 30th, 2017 to December 31st, 2017 on November 20th, 2017 at 9.15 p.m. All interested parties are invited to attend. Okay. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> this is a request for a seasonal extension, uh, an extension of a seasonal license that's been granted at this location for uh, Thompson Country Club. There is no statutory obligation for posting the hearing notice in the newspaper or for mailing to a Butters. In the past, we have communicated with uh, Butters through the Thompson Club, and they have uh, mailed uh, notices to their members who uh, would constitute the, a butters if a butter notification was required. In this particular instance, because of the timing associated with the request, we, um, in conjunction with Thompson Country Club, asked them to communicate via email with their membership, and I'm told that they have a, an active membership list electronically, and I'm also told that they communicated with their members to apprise them of this, uh, of this request. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to, um, to their representative. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Tim Hooten. I serve as the secretary for the Thompson Country Club. Um, as you may remember, uh, earlier this year, uh, we had asked, we have a seasonal license, and under the rules of the seasonal license, it comes April, uh, under your, it goes April 1st to the end of October. Um, the ABCC allows you to extend it as long as you want, as long as there is 90 days 
on which the club is closed. Now, obviously, January, February, March, it, it would include uh, more of those 90 days. Um, you were nice enough to extend it to the end of November uh, at a hearing earlier this year. And what's happened is, um, much as we had hoped, um, it's not the golfers, it's actually the members of the green. The, the members of the green are the condo association that are, are also members of our club. Well, um, clearly, we don't want the golf course open in December. That's, you know, it seems, I'm sure, first blush looking at this application, you think that this is a little ridiculous, nobody's going to be going there. But what's happened is we've been approached by the green. Um, four different groups want to have a Christmas party there. And so we're, we would normally, if we didn't have a liquor license, we would come before you for a one-day license. Uh, in other words, the club isn't going to be open. What they're looking for in December is we want to see if we can host, if these people could have it. It's about, average about 40 people. It's on four separate dates. I think that, that it actually encompasses two weekends, like a, a, a Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, of these groups just um, who uh, live in the green to have their about 40 to 50 person um, Christmas party. So that's what we're asking. The only, the only acceptable way to do this is to extend the license for the whole month. Again, um, the club, I believe, are we closing this weekend or? We're, we're actually, this weekend. We're at the golf course itself and the, um, the restaurant is closing this weekend. So um, we're not gonna be open for, for drinks or anything like that. We're just looking for this to, we said we, because the people, I mean, we're trying to get good relationship with the Greens. They've been very nice to us. So we said we would present this on behalf of them. Okay. Pretty simple request, uh, any questions of the board? Concerns, Mr. Minupelli. How do you? How would you staff that though? With because if if you're closing and your current staff is, are you serving alcohol at these? We would. That's why we need the license extended. We couldn't. Right, serve. Right. We could have it without um, alcohol right now. We could have right, it because we have right. a picture of the license today. So <coughs> right. we're just looking to extend it. So yes, yeah, so we would bring back staff for those four days. Yeah, regular, normal the staff. That yeah, we have we have people that. They don't have, uh, this is kind of a part-time job for them, <coughs> so they don't go someplace else, or they don't leave us at the end of the year. They just um, go and do whatever they do. They, they have families, and you know, but uh, they, we have enough people that would come back. I mean, we're talking a small event. I mean, it'd only be staffed like two or three people. We have, you know, you're talking light hors d'oeuvres and, and some drinks. Is that moving? We'll take a motion. Sure, Mr. Chairman, I move to extend the seasonal club license for Thompson Club Inc. DBA TCC Grill to Mid Iron Drive from November 30, 2017 to December 31, 2017. Make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Minupelli. Any more discussion? I think this is a uh, happy uh, holidays. Good idea, and it's great to see the greens. Uh, the folks that live in the greens are using it. You know, we to. It's a nice commitment to the, their little community, so uh, I thank, hope they get enjoyment from it. And it was nice to see somebody else suffer through the if tax classification hearing. <laughs> I've been through <laughs> 17 of them so far, so it's, it's nice to see someone else have to do it. So yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. You know, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. When can they pick up the license, Mike? Tomorrow. Happy holidays. <coughs> minutes. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 6, 2017 regular session minutes as written. Second. Second. I got a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 6, 2017 executive session minutes as written. Got a motion a second by Mr. Manupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. And that's it for the minutes. And Mr. Gilberto, I'm going to turn it over to you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I think as most in the community are well aware, we are actively working with Pulte Homes of New England towards a closing to uh, convey 104 Lowell Road, the former J.T. Berry property, uh, to Pulte Day Homes. We uh, have been targeting a closing for next week. <coughs> right now with Pulte Day Homes, we are now targeting a closing for Friday, uh, December 1st. Uh, it's a conditional closing. There's a couple of uh, things that remain uh, that need to be met, but that we are projecting that will be addressed between now and then. Uh, this is an agreement that would effectively pave the way for that closing uh, on that date. Um, 
we have it uh, approved to approve, be approved substantially to form because they're still working out some of the details with Pulte Homes uh, between uh, the councils involved, our council and theirs. Um, but uh, we expect things to be uh, resolved uh, shortly. We're optimistic that things will be resolved shortly. So this action would authorize the chairman to sign a second amendment to the purchase and sale agreement uh, in accordance with uh, the general terms included in the uh, document. <coughs> I believe we prepared a motion um, that should be in your packet under motions three. Uh, Mr. Schultz, you may not have that motion in front of you. Uh, um, motion on number seven? Uh, it, you, I believe you probably have the initial draft. Okay. No, There's it's a. It's, it's use it on if you could go into your I have it right drop here. box, yes. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we'll take a motion. Motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve substantially in the form presented the Second Amendment to the Purchase and Sales Agreement with Pulte Homes of New England for the sale of 104 Lowell Road and to authorize the Chairman to sign on behalf of the Board the final form of said amendment as prepared by Town Council. Second. Yes. Motion. I have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? No, just get it done. That's all. We're trying. <laughs> we're trying. But uh, I want to thank the administration. Uh, it's every day we've been working on this, and we're one step closer. And I want, and I do appreciate Pulte and all the time and they've given us to answer our questions, and, and the state as well. They've worked closely with us as we try to wrap up uh, our agreement with DCAM. So. Any uh, more discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> okay. And we're down to the town administrator's report, which I believe is in the meeting packet, right? It is, yes, Mr. Chairman. Just two items of note. The first is that uh, seasonal collection of yard waste uh, began this past Saturday. Uh, it was a curbside collection on Saturday. There'll be another curbside collection two weeks from that date, uh, or Saturday, December 2nd, 2017. Uh, no plastic bags. Uh, DPW, through their contracted uh, collector, JRM, will collect uh, bag leaves uh, in the brown bags as well as uh, branches no greater than three inches in diameter and cut to lengths of no more than three feet in length. And waste must be curbside by 6.30 a.m. Our yard waste center is open. Uh, will be opened through the end of November. Um, so uh, that, that leaves the last weekend for drop-off actually being this coming weekend, and the hours are on the DPW website, but I believe they're 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock on Saturday and 12 o'clock noon till 4 o'clock on Sunday. The second item, again another DPW item, is that there's an updated version of the DPW's mailbox policy, uh, which has been posted on the DPW website. Um, the most significant change is that we'll be working towards running uh, any requests for damage to mailboxes through our, either our insurance company or if it's a contracted plow driver, their insurance company. Um, and again, uh, residents are encouraged to contact us if they have an issue with uh, any damage to their mailbox. <coughs> and the final item, um, I have a memorandum addressed to the board that I'd like to read to for the edification of the community. Again, uh, from myself to the board and it's regarding the retirement of Fire Chief William Warnock. Uh, I'm writing to inform you, the board, that Fire Chief William Warnock has informed me of his intention to retire effective January 21st, 2018. Chief Warnock began his career as a North Reading call firefighter on August 31st, 1982. He became a permanent firefighter in 1987 and was promoted to the rank of fire captain in 1998 and was promoted to the rank of deputy chief in 2007. On April 21st, 2011, he was appointed acting chief, and on January 18th, 2013, he became fire chief. Under his leadership, the fire department expanded in size and scope with the implementation of advanced life support emergency medical services and the hiring of additional firefighters in 2012. Chief Warnick is a firefighter's firefighter, and during his tenure as chief, he was always available to respond to emergencies. In addition to his presence at incidents big and small at any hour of the day or night, Chief Warnock regularly filled in the gaps when our town needed something necessary to be done. He was a steward of the flag on our beautiful North Reading Common. The Chief was also a source of strength for many of us when former Information Technology Director Eugene Tork fell ill and passed away in 2016. I'm grateful to Chief Warnock for his service and loyalty to the town, and I will miss his passion for firefighting and for the North Reading Fire Department. I respect Chief Warnock's request for privacy for this personal decision, and I wish the Chief good luck and good health in his retirement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. OK. 
Okay. And we'll start off with Mr. O'Leary. Well, first of all, congratulations to Chief Warnock and uh, retiring. I wish him a uh, long, healthy uh, retirement. And it's important to note that, uh, by the way, use the word passion. I mean, that, that's an understatement when it comes to uh, <laughs> the Chief Warnock. Talk about passionate. He is a passionate firefighter. Not to mention he's also a third generation firefighter in the North Reading Fire Department uh, with his grandfather and father before him. So uh, terrific public servant and uh, wish, him, wish him well in his retirement. Um, and I know all of us uh, yesterday were at the uh, annual Thanksgiving dinner and again want to uh, thank, uh, first of all, Linda Jones, along with dragging along Representative Jones and, uh, and Senator Tarr uh, at the annual event. They, Terrific uh, afternoon and uh, entertainment and good meal and it's always great to get together. It's a community event that everybody enjoys and it's great that they've uh, continued hosting it. So appreciate it very much. Um, just uh, hope everybody has safe travels. They're talking about record numbers of people on the road this over this holiday season. So hope every everybody travels and gets home back and forth safely. And finally, uh, good luck to the Hornets and the quest to beat the pioneers from Linfield and uh, take Turkeley's back you know so with uh, good luck to the uh, the football team and uh, may they bring victory home thank you mr. chairman thank you mr. Masseri I too would like to uh, congratulate uh, chief Wanick uh, for his years of service his loyalty to the community and I wish him well on his retirement and uh, his future endeavors I'd also like to uh, wish the entire board for a happy and safe Thanksgiving and uh, look forward to uh, the signing of the Putty contract and thank you, Mr. Prisco, for all your efforts and everyone else that has put time and effort into making this a major, major step forward for the community from the point of view of now maybe having enough capital to move forward with our economic development uh, goals. Thank you. Team effort. Mr. Yeah, I um, so want to thank the chief for his time in service, long time in service with the town. And Mr. O'Leary said people on the roads. So we're going to see a lot of them Thursday morning or at 8 a.m. running down Central Street, in North Reading Turkey yes. Trot. And I want to uh, congratulate all the people that finished the Get Fit North Reading program. It was a very successful program we had. I'd like to start it in the spring again. We had 41 people out there and I think many of them are going to run a turkey trot for the first time and I see one of them in the crowd smiling at me typing over there. Um, but have a great holiday everyone and I uh, wish you and your family the very best. I'll be doing the turkey walk stroll, not necessarily the trot. But, um, <laughs> I just wanted to congratulate the chief as well and wish him the best of luck in whatever he decides to do in his future. And um, also just mention the veteran service. It was a very well done. Congratulate Sue Magner and we had the student MC Sam Barrett was there. Sam Barrett was there and um, beautiful vocalist Tamika Thurston. Uh, Major Grant was there. North Reading Police Honor Guard. The Minute Militia was there. The North Reading High School Band was there. The Scouts were there. Uh, all the veterans that attended. It was very well done. Um, well attended. Um, it was a it was a nice remembrance. It was a nice day to celebrate and also remember remember the veterans. So a, a job well done to Sue Magner, and also to Mary Prenny too for the for that delicious dinner and and uh, uh, representative and Mrs. Jones for that delicious uh, dinner for the elderly, which was also well attended. So happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, hope you have a peaceful, safe holiday. Thank you. I have a few things this evening, so I'll try to go as quick as I can. Uh, first thing is, uh, you know, the town administrator mentioned the leaves and the, the pickup, but I also want to remind the community that if you have a lot of leaves around a drain near your home, if you uh, physically can do it, if you could try to your best to move them away. I noticed we did have the DPW out yesterday working around the community to try to clear the leaves from those great those grates because obviously when the rain comes and if we get the cold weather and freezes, it, it does cause a massive uh, um, safety issue. So if you, <coughs> if you could do that, uh, it would much appreciate it. Uh, is it's been now, 
I think, three weeks since we started the Ring and Ride program, and I just want to report back to the community that it has been, the feedback has been wonderful. I couldn't be happier, and uh, in we need the help of the community to get the word out to the seniors and our disabled veterans to let them know that the service is available to them. And this, it's very easy, very user-friendly, and I hope more and more in the community take advantage of it. And I want to thank all the riders that have uh, submitted their feedback to the transcript and uh, made phone calls and sent emails. Uh, we do appreciate the feedback because it's helpful for people to trust that it is not the ride. Uh, it is not the ride from uh, the MBTA. It is the ring and ride from the MVTA, MVRTA, which is a significantly different service, and I hope <coughs> folks take advantage of it. I wish all those in the turkey trot well, and um, it looks like a good weather day for it. So best of luck, and best for our best of luck to our North Reading Hornets. And um, I want to also thank the, the Jones family and all the folks that came out for the dinner yesterday. It was a wonderful time, as always. And uh, the club did a great job getting out the dinner, and it was wonderful to see all the seniors and enjoy the meal. And the entertainment was always special Excellent. and uh, a lot of fun. And let's see, Chief Warnick, I will wish him the best. Your letter was very nice, uh, nicely written. Written. Uh, I don't think I could have said any more than what you have there. And we wish him and his family uh, best in his next endeavors. And I'm sure his department will miss him. There was nobody that advocated better for, for them than he did. Uh, he's certainly a strong advocate, and I'm sure uh, we will always uh, see him around the community and look forward to it. And I want to wish all my board members a happy Thanksgiving to you and your families. And Enjoy it. Uh, certainly thankful for the board and all the work that we've put in this year. And I look forward to uh, us meeting one more time before the holidays and then taking a little break. So thank you. Mr. Gilberto. Uh, Three no. more times. Three more times. Oh, boy. November 28th, December 4th, <laughs> December 18th. That. Oh, good. All right. And if uh, nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. A motion. Second. Yes, second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Well done.